So you heard of this fourth generation core series processor from Intel, codename Haswell, but what do you actually need to get a Haswell system going? Well, some of these things, that's for sure. Don't worry guys, no awesome computer components were harmed in the making of this video, but uh, here's a more digestible version of that. The components that are affected by Haswell are the CPU, obviously, the motherboard, the power supply, that's an unexpected one, but I'll explain more about that later, and to a lesser extent, your system memory. Okay, so yeah, the performance is different and the box art is definitely different, but there's going to be some things that are familiar about the new Core Series processor. In fact, it even pretty much looks exactly the same once you get the box out. So we're going to go ahead and show you how to install your new Haswell chip. But again, this is going to look pretty familiar because even once you get it out of the little plastic sleeve, making sure to ground yourself and be working at an anti-static workstation. So I use an ankle strap in order to make sure I'm grounded. Once you take it out, you're going to go, okay. So you align the golden arrow with the little arrow indicated on your motherboard socket. Okay, so this looks an awful lot like LG 1155 and 1156. Intel has now figured out that it's easiest to not have to re-educate users and they're using the same overall design. So check this out. You line up the golden arrow, lift up the arm, align the golden arrow again, carefully place the CPU into the socket, give it a little wiggle to make sure it's in place, lower the retention plate, lower the retention arm, and your CPU is installed. Next up, you grab your heatsink, which actually looks identical to the LGA 1155 one. So Intel has made things simple again. Even if you have an aftermarket heatsink, the mounting is identical on Haswell. The spacing of the holes is the same and the stock cooler is actually the same as well. So just make sure you've got enough slack on the wires to reach the CPU fan header on your motherboard. Position all four push pins over the holes on the board and then push them in at diagonals. The pre-applied thermal compound is good enough and you have now installed your Haswell CPU just like you did with the last gen one, but just like more performance now. So while the installation process is the same, the chipset on the board and obviously the socket are different, so you'll need a new motherboard, an LGA 1150 motherboard. In this case, we've got a couple Z87 boards. All the usual suspects from the Z77 days are back. So you've got your ASUS, Gigabyte, MSI, ASRock, and we see a lot of continuing themes as well. So say, for example, if you wanted uh, you know, an extreme overclocking board, a Maximus 6 formula is a great option, just like the Maximus 5 formula was with a few tweaks. So for example, the onboard audio, which was already outstanding on the Maximus 5 formula, is even better on the Maximus 6 formula. The uh, onboard Wi-Fi on the Z77 Deluxe Class ASUS board yeah, now is Wi-Fi AC which I've seen demoed at over 850 megabit per second sustained, which is very, very impressive for onboard wireless AC. So what is it? It's the same, but more and better. So you get more native USB 3 ports, up to six, more native SATA 36 gigabit per second ports, up to six, and just in general, all the latest tweaks. So I'm kind of hidden here behind the tower of power. So, Haswell has some new power states that are a little bit different from what we've seen in the past. Now, it used to be that when you got a new you know, CPU or GPU, the first thing you wanted was more power, more watts, all that kind of stuff. Now it's totally different. For the new C6 and C7 power states on Haswell, these are low power states for when the system is idling. We're not doing anything that allow it to draw very, very little power. Though unfortunately, many older power supplies were not designed to deliver just a tiny, tiny little bit of power. They were designed more about like this kind of power. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you get a Haswell certified power supply. All the ones you see in front of me right here are Haswell certified, but if you want to be certain, there will be a link to a list of Haswell certified power supplies in the description of this video, so just double check before you get it. Now your system will still work even without a Haswell certified power supply, but those low, lower power states won't. So if you want to get the most out of it, 
get a qualified power supply. Which leads us to RAM. Now one of the things I said was that RAM is affected to a lesser extent. And what I meant by that is that you can buy Ivy Bridge optimized memory and use it with your Haswell system. No problem. No big deal. The one real difference is the fact that Haswell's integrated memory controller is, by and large, excellent. So while the supported DDR3 speeds aren't that different, I have heard anecdotally that even up to 70% of Haswell chips are capable of running DDR3 2800 MHz or even 3 GHz out of the box, which is very, very cool. So all of a sudden, those high-speed memory kits, some of which couldn't even run at stock speed on many Ivy Bridge chips, can be able to stretch their legs fully with Haswell. Now, the one thing to bear in mind is that once you start to overclock your Haswell, so overclock the CPU core speed, your memory frequency ceiling does start to lower. So you can pretty much guarantee once you're overclocking to 4.4, 4.6, 4.7 gigahertz that you're going to get anywhere from DDR3 1600 speeds to 1866 or maybe 2133 if you're lucky. So just things to bear in mind. If you're running at stock speed, then you'll probably be able to run very high memory speeds. But if you go higher, then your memory speeds are going to be more like what we saw with Ivy Bridge in terms of, of what you can sustain. Thank you. For checking out this Haswell Buyer's Guide, don't forget to subscribe to NCIX Tech Tips for more videos like this from NCIX.com.